there is more streaming of data or less streaming of data? In uh, other words, okay. which are the better of the two after that? Yeah, for streaming data, um, uh, both of them, uh, both the uh, Kalman filter and the um, particle filter can be uh, highly uh, effective. Um, uh, I actually have some slides on um, Kalman filtering that provide more, more detailed discussion of trade-offs um, if, if there's um, interest in this, and I could send them along. Um, th some of them are, are fairly uh, technical matters. Um, uh, th they have to do with uh, the model form, uh, this issue of linearization. They have to do with the form, the assumptions concerning the model uh, noise, uh, both in observations and in um, uh, and in the, in terms of the um, process noise. Um, but I, I will put these up here for anyone who's interested. The Coleman filter is an earlier and much more restricted um, technique. It's a technique that's um, designed for very high performance use, like updating multiple times a second. And um, it's designed for use with very specific sorts of models. Uh, so models that support ready, ready linearization and are Traditionally, there are state-space models depicted as ODEs or difference equations, um, rather than say agent-based models or different or, or, or discrete math simulation models. Um, the Kalman filter is also very notably different in that it it has a privileged um, estimate, a, a maximum likelihood estimate. That's a point estimate, and, and it has a covariance matrix around it that's assumed to uh, be associated with a multivariate normal distribution, where uh, across the different uh, across the different dimensions, you can have different uh, degrees of, of uh, variance, and you can have covariance sort of skewing between relationships between how one. Um, one variable differs uh, uh, of the state uh, co-varies with another. But um, it's, it's assumed to be centered at a certain point and have a univariate distribution. By contrast, um, the particle filter, um, uh, it, and, well, I should say that sort of assumption can work very well with linear models. But when you have nonlinear models, what's very typical is you'll have different basins of attraction, meaning you'll have different possibilities where maybe, um, uh, well, if you think about the communicable disease context, which you're very attuned to, you might have a situation where you have a disease that can be endemic and therefore uh, circulate at higher levels or die out depending on the vaccination rate. And depending on uncertainty about the underlying vaccination rate, the number of people in the population that are vaccinated, you might get rather different dynamics and very different, like if you pause at higher vaccination rates, it'll mean the disease may be uh, dying down in its ability to spread. If you pause at lower vaccination rates, it may be that it's gathering steam. And it may lead to and understanding, considering two different hypotheses of the underlying situation that are, are, are not evenly spread between them, they're not unimodal. Instead, you have two different competing understandings. It's kind of like, am I on the left or right side of the stairs? Is the disease established in spreading, or is it you know, just uh, going through blips and dying out due to exogenous cases coming in from overseas, right? And um, if you have those situations of disparate understandings that are not um, that are not centered at one understanding, um, particle filtering is really what you want because a Kalman filter is going to privilege kind of one central hypothesis and variance around it as as the uh, as the most competitive one, and it's not going to brook descent in terms of very different um, multimodal uh, hypotheses. Uh, so particle filtering, in my view, is a, is a much better match 
to um, to the needs within the context of nonlinear models, and um, and in terms of um, uh, models that that are not necessarily lin uh, linear. Oh, excuse me, not necessarily uh, formulated as uh, state equations, ODEs uh, or otherwise, other types of state equations. So for example, agent-based discrete event simulation. We can do that in particle filtering. We can't do it effectively in uh, traditional common filtering and invariants. Um, and uh, this, uh, the significance of the issue of of multimodal distributions. It may seem a purely conceptual sort of um, uh, matter, but you'll notice here, for example, uh, shown on the screen right now, is a very uh, compelling case of that. So here, for example, we have data um, till about time 250 here. Um, following that, the model has sort of varying understanding of what's likely to evolve. Part of the particles are positing a situation that leads to um, very low levels or comparatively lower levels of susceptibility. But it's a large set of particles, quite a bit of probability mass that, that posits you know, a fairly low number of susceptibles. Others are positing a high and growing number of susceptibles. And what you'll notice across all of these diagrams um, uh, in this slide is a very non, non normally distributed uh, sort of uncertainty about the number of susceptibles, number of exposed, the number of in infectives, and the number of recovered. These are not normally distributed quantities. Um, and it, indeed, in epidemiology, I mean, it's, it's quite rare that things are really normally distributed when you get small numbers of incident cases, for example, right? You could argue that its log might be normally uh, distributed and it's log normal, but, um, but uh, it, that breaks down as well with small number of cases. So the point is, um, Coleman filters are great for missiles or planes or, or rockets. I don't know if anything's great for missiles, but, uh, but rockets and planes, they're, they're, you know, they can be very effective. But um, in the context of epidemiological data, I think, Techniques that allow you to sample from an underlying distribution that's not merely unimodal, not merely um, uh, normally distributed, and where the underlying model doesn't have to be linear or indeed doesn't have to be state equations are very important. And for all of these, particle filtering is a more competitive approach. Yeah. So, um, great question. Um, other questions I could I could answer right now before I get to some some um, important tips associated with uh, with running it. Yeah. Quick question. So when so how do you make sure when you uh, when you pull from the distribution you get the same ones? How do you make sure that di they're diverse again? How do you make sure they're all different? Very very good question. So um, I'll 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 comment on that. So I noted that um, particle filtering really makes sense to apply when you have stochastic processes. So the underlying evolution of the model uh, exhibits stochastics. And, and what this means is that even if um, you start with the same state shared between two particles, or at some point at a, in time, say following a resampling event, they have the same state, they are going to uh, diverge in value um, because the stochastics that they undergo will be different between time t and time t plus one. So if we look at um, our, our distributions here, um, for example, that we use to, to introduce uh, stochastics here, this is what's called a Wiener process. This is a Wiener process. What this means is a random walk's occurring in terms of this. A random walk is occurring in term of this. And you can make that random walk very slow or you can make it faster, but the basic deal is that the contact patterns and the uh, reporting rate, um, that's less germane for, because it's, it's just affecting the observations, but the number of infections, these are all evolving stochastically. So what that means is different particles, even if they have the same initial state, 
um, they will be associated with a different B, uh, yeah, excuse me, different beta here. They'll be associated with a different number of infections that occur from susceptible um, taking people to exposed. And therefore, their states will evolve um, differently. Um, and so uh, you need enough stochastics to broaden that because if all the models um, stay pretty clustered, together in their understanding. They're all in lockstep. They all think this is the case. It'll be hard to take advantage of new data when it comes in because there'll be so little variance. It may favor one particle over another, but it's, it's, it's you know, not a meaningful difference between particles. It's such a small variance that it's not going to really matter in terms of model performance. So you really want a requisite variety amongst the particles. So having stochastics that are fairly um, significant when it comes to model evolution is very important. Um, and that's very important for getting particles which started with the same value following the resampling to meaningfully diverge. Are those helpful comments? So you just basically, you have a random number generator, you just change the seed. Yeah. Start from the same state, but change Yeah, state. yeah, e exactly. That, that's exactly it. They, they have different seeds associated okay. with them. And um, maybe I'll, I'll just use that just to say um, stochastics play a very important role in these models. And it's not merely random initial state. It's, it's stochastics on an ongoing basis. So particle A and particle B, even though they may be close cousins and they have the same state right now, they will, uh, will diverge. And really at a philosophical level, um, it's a matter of giving our model a certain amount of humility <laughs> that, look, this model may be pretty good, just like our mental model is pretty good, but, you know, if we trusted our mental model to, you know, and totally discarded all evidence, we wouldn't survive the day, probably. Um, we, we need a certain humility that, look, there's things I don't know, there's things I don't remember, there's things that I'm off on in terms of my memory on to go through and navigate the world in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's similarly, these stochastics are, are about giving the model humility. At the same time, you know, we don't want to, in life, just say, well, I have no clue of any regularities in the world. You know, I don't know what's the case, you know, um, and I can't operate at all. We don't want a model that's so insecure about its understanding that, or so broad in its understanding that uh, it can't effectively anticipate what's, what's coming. So there's this actually this really key balance in the model between avo avoiding underconfidence and overconfidence. We want a model that, that is not so tight in its understanding that all the particles are in lockstep in their understanding of what's going on we have too narrow a distribution. Um, if new data comes in, we just ignore it. <laughs> or, or essentially, it doesn't lead to a material difference in the, in the model understanding because the model is just so bullheadedly thinking this is the case that a new data point comes in and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really consider it seriously. By contrast, we want to avoid underconfidence here. We want to avoid uh, a model that is such pronounced stochastics that if if we don't you know if we consider what's likely to occur tomorrow or the next day or the next day it just throws up its hands and says I have no clue. We want a model that captures the regularities well, well enough that allows us to look forward to maybe another month, another two months, um, uh, you know, however long our time frame demands. Um, but it's not so um, it's not so overconfident that it dismisses uh, new data coming in. And the the primary way that we accomplish this is by having stochastics. Okay, and stochastics really um, play uh, a couple roles. One is they actually characterize stochastic processes in the world. Like okay, over time as people's concern about an outbreak, an incipient outbreak, rises, it may be that people are more likely to report a case of illness. So if people think, oh man, I, I heard H1N1 is killing young people, um, 
event. And it's not just you know people in nursing homes that are dying or people in hospitals. It's actually younger people. Maybe if I'm feeling the symptoms that could be flu, I'm going to go to the hospital. Maybe too much sometimes. Right? I, I go to the ER when all I have is a cold. Um, uh, but I, I present for care. The point is that that something like reporting rates um, and even contact rates, you know, often rise um, or often change over time. So some of our stochastics represent that. But a lot of our stochastics in these models are tuned to provide a degree of humility to the model. It's to keep the model open to something different. To keep it open to new possibilities. To the fact that it can't be over, it can't have um, too much hubris in in saying the world is this way, um, and this is again where this verges into philosophy. That do you believe that the model articulates a good theory? Yes, but you know, uh, it's not a theory. I'm going to you know, put all my eggs in one basket. I want it, I want it to be a theory with ability to adjust as data comes in. Um, and, um, and you know, this is an area where we've done a, a fair degree of tuning and so on. And so often with these models, what you're not seeing is um, there's a certain amount of tuning that goes on with the model. Tuning the degree of stochastics particularly, tuning the level of dispersion associated with the uh, likelihood functions, and to a certain degree, um, the initial state of, of the model. And so often, you know, it might take a couple of weeks of tuning to get the particle filter run, then you set it going, and it can run for months and months and months and months and months, and months um, with new data coming in, something like that. So you get it, you get it uh, nicely tuned. And I know Lugia, for example, did this with his chicken pox model, and there was some tuning required to get it to really perform a tip-top shape. Um, I wanted to offer a few remarks on particle filtering with agent-based models. Um, um, agent-based models um, uh, have had comparatively little um, examination with particle filtering approaches, despite their great compatibility with it. And the reason for this is, is manifold. Um, traditionally, particle filtering, like Kalman filtering, has been done more with models that have explicit mathematical formulation. But there's no reason it can't be done with ABMs. And we have paper uh, that, that examines this, uh, in fact, from an earlier version of this conference. Um, one thing that's true with ABMs is, if you think about, uh, let's take that simple uh, model that we saw with measles. You have SEIR, maybe you have a reporting rate, and you have a contact rate associated with elements of that state. Six state variables. Each particle has six state variables, right? Um, uh, when you have each particle of six state variables, it's comparatively low dimensional state space. Nominally, it's six dimensions. The intrinsic dimensionality is somewhat lower. Um, yeah, but in any case, it's, it's fairly modest dimension. With an ABM, if you have, let's say, three agents, each can be in two states, two possible states, then nominally, you have eight number of, of possible possibilities that, that state, those states could be in, right? If you have n agents, you, and each could be in one of two states, you have two to the n number of possible states that it, it could be in. It's a, it's a quite large state space that you have for ABMs. The truth is the intrinsic dimensionality, the dimensionality of, of how much state it actually occupies in, in any realistic run, that the low dimensional manifold is, is typically the low dimensional, but at least nominally it is a high dimensionality of its state space. And, um, what this means is probably you're going to want a lot of particles. So 10,000 uh, or more particles doesn't seem that unusual. It's perfectly reasonable. We run models with 10,000 particles interactively with, with, uh, with some of our models. It's, it's not that big. But what happens with ABM is you actually need every particle to have a complete ABM within it, right? 
it, it needs a complete copy of the state of the NBM, and that includes all agents, their state, the networks between them, and so on. And each of those particles has to evolve independently between observations, and then add, observ add observations to get its weight updated, right? And, and the particles that are more fit have weight up higher, those less fit, weight lower, and those that at, at resampling, some will die out, et cetera. So it's a very weighty computational resource demand. You typically have a large number of particles, and each particle has to evolve according to an APM, which is fairly expensive. Um, so uh, those like Lugia, who are in our group, are, are pioneering uh, techniques like uh, distributed computation, like using the Spark platform that uh, Lugia will be talked about some of our, of our work on, and GPUs, and, and in the future, FPGAs. Um, are ways to really accelerate this process. I'm very bullish about ABMs with particle filtering. I, I think that the future lies in that, and um, there's tremendous um, potential for exploiting it. How to exploit it well remains, uh, at this point, a black art, and, and we are trying to advance that. To, to be able to provide guidelines for effective particle filtering with ABMs at scale. And um, it's something I'm very enthusiastic about, but something where there's a lot of research to, to deliver at a practical level. Um, OK, um, a few points of note before I just do a very quick walk through through the example model I've given. A few points of note. Each particle, uh, so particle filtering as a whole, regrounds model state based on evidence from latest data. Each particle represents a certain hypothesis about model state. Those that are more consistent are rewarded. Those less consistent tend to die out. And, um, and because of that, collectively, the particles represent a distribution over the current situation. And that distribution is shaped by the new observations. And so we're constantly regrounding our model, this distribution of possibilities in our model, with each new observation. Hmm? We're, we're regrounding it in new empirical data. Um, so, and that includes the latent state of the model. Um, and having done that, we can then project forward. Right? We, can, we can ask, what is likely to be the case? Remember those graphs I showed that showed that outbreak expected, for example, because the Particles that have survived to this point, that have thrived and multiplied, are those that have posited very low incidence, and those all posit high number of susceptibles, and therefore all predict a coming outbreak in the next little bit, because we have lots of tinder around that's flammable. Um, this is what we can do with these models. Project forward, and we can use them for uh, intervention evaluation. You remember also that graph where I compared that to simple calibration. Calibration adjusts parameter values. It adjusts the set of parameters that best match the situation. Particle filtering actually regrounds an understanding of the current state of the system. And in a system that's stochastic, a system where there's a lot of stochastics, you may be pretty confident about your parameter values, but your, your, your state could be far off from what the model unassisted thinks. And this provides you with a way of of updating the state of, of the model. I mean, kind of like not just trying to walk home, but trying to sail home on you know, the ocean with the winds blowing the boat and currents. And you've got to open your eyes periodically and guess where you are. And there's lots of stochastics that can be pushing you around relative to where you think you are. If you especially need your eyes to be open occasionally, right? Um, uh, and uh, the choice of likelihood function is pretty important. Um, uh, and I've given you some examples. The, the negative, like, uh, negative uh, binomial we found very, very helpful. And the example paper I've, I've shared with you uh, is good for that. Particle filtering can take many different lines of evidence and give a portrait of the underlying system. So it's not a one-trick pony. You can take disparate lines of evidence, like search data and clinical presentation data, and dozens more into a given model by just having a likelihood function that, that is composed of, say, products of likelihood involving each of those types of data. Okay, Very straightforward. Um, 
The part of the filter I noted needs to balance too little confidence and too much confidence. And model stochastics are a key component of this to give humility to the model, to leave it be open to correction, needed to realize just how off it can be in its understanding. At the same time, those stochastics can capture real world stochastics that are outside the scope of the model but affect it. And tuning the, the model parameters and stochastics can make a big difference. Okay. Um, um, particle filter is highly versatile because of lack of stick, uh, strict distribution assumptions. It's well suited to work with many public health data streams um, and stochastic models. Um, and it can perform well even in the context of aggregate dynamic models. We have found exceptional models. We've used it with very sophisticated uh, stratified models, say with 30 different age groups and so on. It performs really well. Um, particle filtering, by and large, is a quite reliable technique that's very versatile. It's not something you can only apply to certain subsets of, of models. Um, that are quite specialized. But it's not a turn the crank process. It involves some iteration and some learning. Um, and some progress is required to apply it for ABM and, and DES models. Um, I'll make a plug. I'm, I'm teaching a full week course. Uh, a lot of it, it concentrates on particle filtering and particle MCMC, um, which is a stronger technique yet that tunes parameters as well as and samples from parameters as well as the latent state. It's an awesome technique, um, and it takes this to another level. But I'd like to show you, if I could, in our closing minutes here, a, a, uh, a particle filter model. Um, uh, and in fact, it's the model that I shared with you. Okay, this model is in any logic, um, and I'll just walk you through it uh, very uh, quickly. So the model is one that, uh, that I talked about. It's, it's for measles. And it has susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered um, uh, stocks. Uh, so each particle posits at any one time a certain number of susceptibles, exposed, infectives, and recovered. But it, they'll also posit, each particle will also posit a certain um, uh, reporting rate and a certain beta or transmission rate. Um, actually, it's contact slash and transmission rate wrapped up into one. Okay, so each particle posits each of those. And you may wonder, well, wait a minute, I only see one stock here. What's going on? Well, if you actually go look at how the model is, is captures this, what you'll find is this is, as we say, subscripted or arrayed by particle, okay? So there's, there's a thing called particle. Um, which is which characterizes across here a thousand particles zero to nine nine nine. It's like a subscript um, that you put on this, and so there's a susceptible sub one, a susceptible sub two, or a susceptible sub three. Um, so each particle is this specific value of the subscript, right? Um, and it's the same thing for these flows um, here. Okay, so each of these flows is associated with a certain uh, particle. Mm -hmm. And uh, by and large, um, between uh, observations, these run more or less, uh, whoa, more or less independently. Um, but it's really where observations occur that you see um, the action uh, happen in terms of, you know, the unique logic of, of particle filtering. And uh, the way in which that's captured is with an event here. I, I recognize people don't necessarily uh, know any logic, but there's an event, receive empirical observation. And this actually receives an observation, and it basically checks, hey, is particle filtering on? If so, um, process it for the particle filter. And here, basically, um, uh, we will go and if, if it's, as long as it's less than the time where we want to simulate having all the data till then, and it's kind of the current point we project forward. If it's during the point we're still doing particle filtering, we update the weights based on the observation. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the effective sample size is less than the minimum, we will do the resampling step. Okay. Um, 
And there's a whole set of things here like um, uh, here, resample and update weights and particles and update particle values with sampled indices and resample indices and sample particles by weights, etc. Um, this update weights based on observation is kind of the core, um, the core thing where it actually goes through and it multiplies um, uh, a, uh, the weight at, at earlier with their, the likelihood. So it's actually taking a prior weight, prior to the observation, that's the weight that's applied, and it multiplies it by the likelihood. Um, and then it goes through down here, and it normalizes the weights. Okay. And having normalized the weights, we, we um, uh, will print out a bit of information. So, um, this is a, a model whose structure mirrors that of um, uh, many other uh, models um, that we've run. And uh, you can find a video of me talking about its structure in uh, more, uh, more detail here. Um, but uh, fundamentally, um, uh, it's a, a reusable model structure. And if you run this model, um, what you will find is over time, there's uh, evolution of the model um, in response to uh, incoming data and in response to the simulated particle filtering. If we go look at this uh, in a little bit more detail, what we'll find is at any one time, if we look at the exposed population, You'll actually see, I don't actually like doing this that much in front of groups because you always have to remember particles are not to be looked at by themselves, to be looked at and sampled from according to the weight. But it bears noting that each of these stocks of the model is associated with different values for each of the particles. So particle zero, for example, thinks there's 93 about 90, 94 people in the exposed state. Particle two begs to differ. It thinks there's 172. Particle eight thinks there's 130 here. Um, and those different particles have these competing visions of the world, these competing hypotheses that are um, undergoing the survival of the fittest. Um, and of course, each of those particles is associated with uh, a separate weight as well, which, um, which is also, uh, also captured in the, in the model, and I'd have to go and, and find it here, but um, uh, it's associated with a different weight. Now, as this model runs, you will also find trajectories etched out. So you'll notice here, this is in blue, this is sampling from the distribution of particles. Um, and I want to emphasize this sampling takes into account the weight associated with particles. So something that's of weight two is twice as likely to be sampled than a given draw of a particle associated with weight one. And it's just plotting out for this is the number of, um, I think, th the model's expectation for how many infections will occur. Uh, versus the empirical uh, empirical data, uh, which is shown here in red. And so as the model runs, um, each new data point is simulated coming in here, and the model is tracking that. The model is, is um, taking that into account, rewarding particles that are consistent with it, um, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, punishing, as it were, particles or, or dispossessing particles that are less consistent and, and over time it's, it's, it's matched. So here it's uh, simulated coming in and you can see it trying to match out. This is the simplest model, it wasn't the, the very highest performing, but even so it does a good job. Meanwhile, you can see that um, not only was, was that being computed in, in terms of a way it could be um, compared with empirical data, we have a number of susceptibles uh, characterized as well here. Um, number of exposed, there's a down, down here, the number of infectives and the number of recovered individuals as well. 
and this is uh, contacts per month and uh, fraction reported uh, incident. And not surprisingly, um, there's uh, fluctuations, for example, in contacts per month, potentially associated with seasonal variations. It looks quite, uh, quite seasonal. They are quite uh, varied in a, almost a sinusoidal way. So this is a model that illustrates the principles of, um, of particle filtering in an interactive way in a way that can be run and using um, methods and, uh, and sort of code underlying it that can be adapted for other contexts. And we've taken this basic template um, as it was first articulated in a model I created uh, with, with joint work with uh, uh, mathematical statistician Zhu Xin Liu. And that model has now been used for maybe based in, basing on 15 to 20 different models like this. Uh, it's a very reproducible structure. Luja, do you want to show any uh, final update from yours? Is that worth uh, showing? Okay. 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 Zero, zero visit this morning. So. <laughs> Come to the true north, <laughs> strong and free, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, so, so this provides a bit of a glimpse of a of a running model. Uh, Luce, perhaps you can keep that going during the day and. Uh, you can uh, you can see new uh, new new uh, data come in. Any questions I can answer about this? This has been a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I hope I've given you some aspects of the intuition, some aspects of the philosophy, a hint as to how it can be implemented, um, and uh, some gut feel for it. Uh, I've also provided some detailed slides, and I will just point to them for your resource um, uh, here. I have put on here um, uh, and under participant resources, uh, the draft slides. This provides information on these slides I've just presented, but I also have information on PMCMC, which is a technique I'll be speaking about. Um, at our event uh, later this month in, um, that focuses on bringing together data science and system science. And uh, I also talk about MCMC, which is a technique for sampling from parameters that merges with particle filtering to form PMCMC. Um, uh, I will further note um, that I have uh, provided the sample model, uh, the paper, that describes it and characterizes its use and its formulation and a supporting library, um, which you uh, may want to, to use. So um, uh, those are, um, uh, oh, and then finally I did provide some supplemental slides, including some application examples, um, uh, some based on uh, MCMC, PMCMC, um, and some comments on data science and ways that data interfaces with dynamic models. Okay, that's all for this morning. Thank you, thank you so much for your uh, kind comments. And uh, please speak with me at any time during this event. I have six talks I'm responsible for, one of which that uh, Luke is, is given. Um, this is, is one of them. Um, but uh, I'll be around uh, for the event, and I'm happy to discuss if there's any interest in these techniques more. If you want to learn more about PMCMC or any of its variants or want ex additional examples. Thanks very much. <laughs>